I want to invite you to download the first chapter of my new book, The Introvert's Edge to Networking, totally for free. As an introverted small business owner, how do you succeed at networking without changing who you are? Let's do this together. Take a second to think about the last time you were out networking. I mean, let's face it, for the average introverted small business owner, we'd rather get a root canal than go into the networking room. Why? Because we feel like networking is mostly transactional. We see those extroverts walking into the room going, do you wanna buy from me? You wanna buy from me? What about you? What about you? And that is the last thing that we we want to be doing. However, if we don't behave like that, then we tend to do what is called aimless networking, which is having these shallow conversations with business owners that they say what they do, we say what we do. No one really shows much interest. We may even downplay what we do to make it harder for them to show interest. And then there's that exchange of business cards where we then excuse ourselves to go out to the bathroom or to go to the bar to get away from them and then from us. And we then tell ourselves when we get home with our pile of business cards that we're not gonna reach out to them. They'll reach out to us if they're interested. Of course, we never get a phone call and nothing ever happens with them. That's why we feel like networking is a waste of time and why would we do something that is uncomfortable that also doesn't work? Well, I'm here to tell you there is a new type of networking and it is called strategic networking. Now, strategic networking can be done in a way that actually leverages the strengths of an introvert while actually allowing us to sidestep the things that we don't like so much like small talk. Now, the power of this is it actually leverages our ability to plan and prepare, our ability to listen, and our ability to empathize with people. See, when we go to networking events, firstly, there's a ton of planning and preparation that can be done before we go. These days, you can pretty much know who's gonna be in the networking room before you even go in, but you will definitely know what to say when you get there. Now, the first thing I tell the average introverted small business owner to change in their conversation is the way they talk about what they do. Usually, the average person introduces their functional skill and then will either move into talking about their credibility or the type of client that they work with. Something like saying, I'm a graphic designer and I've been featured on Forbes and I tend to work with clients that have unique products. What that sounds like, and I know that the average introvert doesn't like to sound this way, but they sound like, hey, I'm trying to get you as a client because I'm trying to buy a brand new motor car and I really think you can help with that. Now, of course, that's the last way we wanna sound, but think about the way we're communicating what we do. It's so I, I, I. I always recommend that introverts talk about their passion and their mission for what they do. Make it more about the person that they're talking to or the impact that they want to have as opposed to the functions and the credibility, which comes across as a resume. And especially for introverts who don't feel comfortable with self-promotion like me, it just feels horrible. So here's how I introduce myself. When somebody asks me what I do, firstly, I use what's called a unified message, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when somebody asks me what exactly that is, I will then respond with, well, one of the things I love to see more than anything in the world is an amazing introverted service provider business owner with enough talent, skill, and belief in themselves to go and start their own business. But one of the things I just hate to see, and I say it happens so often, is these people end up stuck in this endless hamster wheel of struggling to find interested prospects, trying to set themselves apart, trying to make the sale, believing that people only care about one thing, price. Now, do you know anyone like that? Now, of course they do, especially if I've done my planning and preparation beforehand. So when they respond with yes, I then say, well, I'm on a mission to help these introverted service providers realize that they can make amazing money doing what they love but not by focusing on getting better at their functional skill because usually they're amazing at that, but instead by focusing on the three things outside the scope of their functional skill that allow them to create the type of business that revolves around them, their family, and their life, not the other way around. Actually, let me give you an example, and then I'll move into a story. Now, here's what's different with this. 
I haven't talked about me, it's not braggy at all. I've talked about the way I serve others, the things I care about, and think about the energy difference. It would be very hard for me to say passionately that I'm a sales and marketing coach that has worked with organizations as large as Intel, but specialize in helping small businesses obtain rapid growth. But talking about what I love to see, what I hate to see, and the mission that I'm on, it's compelling. People are like, wow, I'm like that. Or they know someone. No one wants to introduce somebody to somebody else that doesn't fill them with energy. But if you share your passion and your mission for serving others and don't make it all about you, all of a sudden you'll have an impact like they've never experienced before. As I said, you then move into a story. Now, a story is so powerful. Firstly, it short circuits the logical mind and you speak directly to the emotional mind. Now, as introverts, we're always so mindful of not capitalizing on people's time, not talking too much and Stories gives us a huge advantage here. It means we can talk for longer and people will actually enjoy it. It also stops us getting into jargon and detail, which introverts tend, I mean, let's face it, we tend to overcomplicate things. Stories stop us doing that. On top of that, it activates what's called the reticular activating system of our brain, which means that our brain synchronizes with the person we're telling this story to, which creates artificial rapport that us as introverts can turn into real rapport. One thing studies say is while introverts struggle with that initial rapport, we're really good at creating long lasting rapport. Something you might say extroverts struggle with. So story is so, so powerful. And when we use story and we get to the end and say, does that make sense? And we do it in a way that is designed to be educational and inspirational, but also embeds us as the only logical choice. People are prone to say, oh my gosh, I need that. How much do you cost? Now, of course, you should never sell in a networking room. I always am telling people this. When I role play with introverts, so often I say, oh, how much do you cost? Or, oh, I need that. What does working with you look like? And they start to answer the question. And then I pretend to be interrupted in a networking room by somebody else. And I then move over to that conversation. And in a role play, it seems weird, but the lesson I'm trying to teach is never sell in the networking room. So the thing that I want you to know is a time will come for sales, but you should never do it in the room when they ask. As a matter of fact, saying to them, look, it's so kind that you asked. Now's not really the time for that. I mean, we're all here networking and then scheduling a follow-up time to have a dialogue with them. Schedule it while you're there though, so you don't have any of that awkward follow-up. Now, how do I start the initial dialogue? How do I get them to say what exactly is that that allows me to talk about my passion and mission? The answer is I introduce a unified message. Now, I discovered this back in 2014 when I first moved from Australia to the United States. See, I made the decision that I was going to be a coach and I was going to work with introverts to help them obtain rapid growth. In the past, I'd always sold a product or service. Now, yes, I'd built five multi-million dollar success stories. However, I never actually sold me before and this was the first time. Well, now I'm going into networking rooms and people would ask me what I did and I'd say, I'm a sales trainer. And people would look at me like I was one step above a scam artist and explain that they're introverted and they could never learn sales or they had a bad experience with a sales trainer in the past. If I said I was a marketing coach, they would then say, oh, I need one of those. How much do you cost? Now I'm talking about price and I just met them. I was trying to find a way to get into talking about the value I provided through passion, mission and story. And I realized that I needed to get out of the bucket. See, a great example of that is a client of mine, Wendy, came to me and she said, look, for the longest time, I've been able to charge $50 to $80 an hour for the private consultation. But now there are so many people moving into California trying to charge $30 to $40 an hour to teach Mandarin that I'm struggling to keep my current clients, I'm struggling to get new clients. Not only that, there's now competition in China offering to do it for $12 an hour and technologies that are available where I can teach you English, you can teach me Mandarin, we just won't charge anyone anything. So she's competing against free. So so I said to her that what we needed to do was avoid the battle altogether because if she goes into a networking room and said that she taught Mandarin, that would go straight into a conversation about price. So I looked at all the people that she'd worked with over the years and she'd worked with hundreds. But what I realized is that of those hundreds of people, there were two people specifically that she helped with far more than just language tuition. These were executives that were being relocated across to China and she helped them understand really three pretty amazing things. 
The first was the difference with rapport in China versus the Western world. In the Western world, we might try and sell something, and if we're bad at our job, we'll say something horrible at the end, like, do you want to move forward? And we'll hear yes, no, or everyone's favorite, let me think about it. We know if we check in a week from now and they still say they want to think about it, we're not getting that deal. Yet, in China, they're going to want to meet with you five or six times before they even discuss business. The requirement for rapport is so different. Gosh, they're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. It's just the character of the person, because they're talking about 25 to 100 year deals, not transactional relationships. She helped them understand that, the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world, the importance of respect, how important it was to hand your business card over the right way and receive one the right way, why it was important to reduce their accent before they went over. Learning the language wasn't enough. And I'm like, Wendy, you do so much more for these people than just language tuition. What are you doing? She said, well, there's just a few things. Like you, she was stuck in her functional skill. People overlook the amazing things they do outside the scope of their functional skill. I said to Wendy, is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance that you're giving these people, they're gonna be more successful in China? She's like, yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? I said, great. Let's call you the China Success Coach. We actually created a total new product called the China Success Intensive, where she worked with the executive, the spouse, and any children being relocated across to China. Now, she loved this idea, but she's like, well, who do I sell it to? What she's asking is, who do I mention this to when I'm out networking? Who do I look for in the networking room? So I asked her, who do you think? Now, she said, well, obviously, it's the executive. Now, I got that. You know, I moved from Australia to the United States. I was terrified. Of course, it would be terrifying for them, too especially considering they speak a different language in China. I just said, it's not your ideal client though. Then she said, well, obviously the company would pay. So she's saying to me, I'm gonna go out and network with companies that have executives being relocated. And while they've got millions of dollars riding on an executive being successful, I believed that her chances of success were higher if she networked for immigration attorneys. See, a lot of people don't know this, but these people get paid five to $7,000 for doing all the paperwork, all the bureaucracy that comes with doing a visa. They've just got to pay to get a customer. They've got staff to pay for. They've got rent to pay for. And I decided that this was the group that she would be able to make the most money out of. So she went to networking rooms and she would introduce herself as the China success coach. And when they asked her what that is, she would then talk about her passion, the things she loved to see, what she hates to see, and her mission for service and then she would move into a story. Now, immigration agents loved her because we came up with this idea of offering them a $3,000 commission for any successful introduction to the China Success Coach. They loved it. They're like, double my profit for a simple introduction? What would I have to say? And we said, well, all you've got to do is say, congratulations, you now got your visa. I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be relocated across to China. The overconfident executive would say, yeah, I think so. I mean, we've got our place sorted. We've got our visa now, thank you. We're learning the language. Kids are getting pretty good at it too. I think we're set. And she would get them to just respond with, well, there's actually a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. Wendy would then get on the phone with the easiest sale in the world. These people were terrified to go. The organization was motivated to pay and they were recommended by their attorney. Now she sold this product for $30,000. Minus the commission check, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world. Now that's rapid growth. I mean, it beats trying to hustle every day in a crowded market to sell something for $50 to $80 an hour. But here's what's key. By introducing herself as the China success coach, she got a totally new conversation because they couldn't put her in a bucket and go, I know what that is, I don't need you, or how much do you cost? Then she learned how to talk about her passion and her mission, and then share a story that educated and inspired while embedded her as the only logical choice. And even better, she got the opportunity to get lead after lead from that same person that she developed the relationship with, as opposed to constantly going out and hustling to find new prospects to sell to. And that brings me to my last point. If you go into a networking room thinking that your goal is to sell to the person you're speaking to, you're actually missing out. See, while prospects are absolutely a necessity, and if you run into one and they say, I want to buy from you, that's a great thing. The real key out of the hamster wheel of struggling to find interested people, trying to set yourself apart, trying to make the sale while feeling like people only care about price is this finding momentum partners and champion relationships. The people like for Wendy, this immigration attorney that constantly introduced her to new clients or just somebody that introduces you to lots of people that have podcasts that are in front of your ideal target demographic is also a great momentum partner and champions, people that give your work credibility. 
For instance, Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group in the world, and a fellow introvert, endorsed my new book, The Introvert's Edge to Networking. Think about the credibility that that gives me and the ability for me to leverage that credibility from this endorsement and the video endorsement that Ivan did to get more people to trust my work and to discover my work. See, I believe that if you can find just a few momentum and champion relationships, you really can leverage that to get out of the hamster wheel of the day-to-day -day and to create the rapid growth business that you deserve. Now, for those that don't know me, my name is Matthew Pollard, and I'm the author of the best-selling book series, The Introvert's Edge. And if you had have told me when I was leaving high school that I would be one day standing in front of a camera and telling people that they can succeed in networking as an introvert, that I would be the author of a best-selling book on the topic showing introverts how to succeed in the networking room, I have to admit, I would never have believed it. See, I think that people are constantly projecting extroversion on people. If they see someone as successful, they naturally assume that they had it easy growing up. See, in late high school, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I was so introverted. And luckily enough, I got diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome, which basically means I put on a pair of funny colored lenses and miraculously, I can learn to read. Not like everyone else, but I could start the process of learning to read. So for two years, I hustled and I actually got into the top 20% of my state when I graduated, but I was exhausted. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And my self-confidence was beaten down. I always felt like the slow kid. I now had these funny colored lenses. I had braces. I had horrible acne. I struggled to talk with my own friends, let alone anyone else. But because I lost my job just before Christmas, a job doing data entry, I fell into sales and learned a system for selling. And then later learned a system for networking as an introvert. And I went on to be responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. It was the ability to discover these systems that I now share with other introverts all over the world through my books that allowed me to truly be successful and has allowed tens of thousands of other introverted small business owners to also be successful. And that is exactly why I wanna help you. I wanna help you succeed as an introvert because I'm passionate about helping you realize that you're not a second class citizen. We as introverts are not second class citizens. Our path to success is just different to that of an extrovert. We're different and we have to embrace that. And that is why I want you to download the first chapter of the Introvert's Edge to networking today so I can show you why you can excel as an introvert in the networking room and all of these so-called extroverted behaviors as well as learn the exact step-by-step -step methodology that you need to excel at networking. So click on the link below, get your first chapter of the Introvert's Edge to networking today, and let's transform your business. Cheers.